I've been a journalist since 2011, and I came to this country in December last year, so just on three months ago. And so I'm not allowed to work at the moment, so I, I'm, I'm doing volunteer work. How's that? Does that sound like a nice concept? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I, I've written 20, 18 print books and two, uh, three iBooks, which are. So an overview today, I'm going to talk about what, what is this thing called mobile journalism. I'm going to give you some reasons to, to use it, and I think essentially it's about empowering you, the individual, to do amazing things. Uh, and if you want to, you could become a single person production house. With the technology is so relatively cheap and so relatively easy to use compared with what it was 20 years ago. When I started in journalism, we had manual typewriters. Anybody used a manual typewriter? <laughs> yeah? And the phones, you went <laughs> It took literally three minutes to make a professional phone call. It was so long for the, for the rotary to come back. And we had hot metal production. It was just, that was only 30 years ago. It's amazing when you think about it, what's happened 30 years ago. So I'll talk about um, Huang's law and, and Moore's law in relation to journalism as well. Um, and also to do with speed. Um, if I may be so immodest, I arrived at the railway station yesterday afternoon about a bit before 4 p.m. and I walked um, to my hotel. It's about a 10 minute walk. And on the way to the hotel, I passed a, a demonstration in the, uh, in I don't know what area you'd call it, it was in sort of the main part of town. And so I took out my phone and I shot some footage and I put together a, a one minute and three second news report, which I'm going to show you, not to illustrate the brilliance of it, but just to show it took me 10, 12 minutes of filming. Uh, I got to the hotel and I spent another 10, 12 minutes of pulling it together, and this is what we got. Oh, sound. Sorry. Need to have sound. Uh, let's see the sound, 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 sound volume. Better crank it up a bit. I checked the volume before, it wasn't it doesn't seem to be enough. Let's see if that oh. is it going through the end? Ah. Uh -huh. Ah. Right. You're gonna to have to imagine the sound. <laughs> so there's a lot of background sound. Essentially it's a the Christians versus the Mohammedans. It depends on the why. Uh. <laughs> we can make this on my machine. It's an audio -vis audio visual medium. You got the visual without the audio. Yes. The loudspeaker. Ah, but you can see that was about a minute. I'll play it again. Just so you can see, I can, I'll make a few points as I go along. So, establishing shot, titles, location, crowd scene, lots of chanting and noise. I just got, got up on a, on a piece of concrete so I could shoot down and get a bit of shot of the of the uh, of the crowd, and then this guy's preaching God. You know, God will save you. And this guy's saying, "Allah is great," and then we yeah, cut away to the to the police who are just sort of, and then a few more crowd scenes. And on some of these occasions, I I put in a voiceover. 
and uh, yeah. at the end, uh, something about peaceful protests, and then what's it all about? And then we finish with these guys saying love and peace, love and peace, love and peace. But the whole thing took 25 minutes, I guess, between arriving on the scene and pressing the, the, the record button on the first piece of video through to having it ready. The only other part I needed to do was upload to, to a, a website or, or send it back to the studio or whatever. <laughs> Always happy with technology. <laughs> yeah. So the, the the point is the speed. Yeah. Um, you can do amazing things, and all I had was just this, just simple. And then I'll talk. Ah, we are. And then I'll talk about uh, the actual software. I'll demonstrate the, the processes involved, and we'll talk about the costings. And the costing, uh, it's actually compared with what it used to cost to do television journalism. Um, when I arrived in this country, I lived here from 79 to 90. I joined ITN in 1987. And we had four person crews. And after a while they amalgamated. So we had a we had a reporter, a producer researcher, a sound person, and a, and a camera person. And after a while they amalgamated the you know, producer and reporter, so down to three. And over the passage of years, the the, 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 the camera person and the sound person got amalgamated, so it became two person teams. But even, even three or two people, we were doing 10 hour days, um, and we do, at the end of a day, we probably get a minute. So it took three people 30 hours to produce one minute. And on top of that, the equipment we were using cost. Sorry, Jim, try to get yeah. On top of that, the equipment cost, uh, back in then, in 1987, the equipment cost about a hundred thousand uh, US dollars. Yeah, the equipment cost 100,000, and we had about 20% loading on top of that for insurance, so 120,000. And now, I don't know, don't know what this costs in this country, 400 pounds or so. So we've gone from 120,000 <coughs> to about 400, and we've gone from we had camera men. They didn't allow women because the cameras were so were so big, so heavy. So we went from from these monstrous cameras down to 300 grams, maybe. So we've had this massive reduction in cost, in in uh, both both cost and time involved. So potentially, if this stuff improves at the speed at which it currently is improving, <coughs> who knows what what you'll have and by the time. I mean, I'm going to retire fairly soon, but you guys will be working in 20 years from now. Imagine what the equipment will be available to you in 20 years from now. Uh, if we do need to stand, I think the TV is outside. Right, OK. Yeah. Um, no, I think we can get by without it. Um, it just it looks it sounds better when you've got sound, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's right. Thanks anyway. Thanks, Kate. Nice. 
So just so we're talking the same language, um, some definitions. So I'm not talking about what people often call video journalism, or backpack journalism, where everything can fit into a sort of very large kit. I'm talking about Mojo, contraction of mobile phone journalism, essentially just one of these. I mean, you can have it. I'll talk about the other bits and pieces of kit that I use, but you can get away with this. Actually, this and power source, <laughs> yeah. because this is useless without electricity. <laughs> that's, a, that's a given. Um, you may be interested to know this was the very first Mojo. That's from the front page of the New York Times, February 1999. Uh, 22 kilograms of kit. And uh, the battery is about the size of a car battery. <laughs> and it was just, yeah, it was a good idea. This is the scientist, the guy who came up with the idea. This is a, a journalism student <coughs> pioneering his way through New York City. But uh, essentially, um, it's about speed. If you can accelerate the way we get journalism done, that's always going to be very attractive. And the point is that technology cannot get in the way of the storytelling. Journalists tell the story. <clears throat> their function, their, their role, their job is to tell stories, to create a form of reality which we call storytelling. And you don't want the technology to get in the way of the storytelling. I was involved uh, in 2008 uh, with a project at the Sydney Morning Herald. Spent six months with the journalists there teaching them mobile journalism. And I wasn't involved in the selection of the, of the mobile phone. And they went for a, uh, a mobile phone called a Jazz Jam. The, the, the IT department chose the, chose the phone. And it was a wonderful phone in terms of bells and whistles. It had so many buttons and so many things that the journalists kept hitting the wrong button. And they got so frustrated and so angry they stopped using the technology. Even though they could see the potential of this piece of kit, it was so complicated and so temperamental that they got, they, in the end, they stopped doing it. So classic example, the technology that's going to be used by the storytellers has to be as simple as possible, which is why I push for, I don't have any shares in Apple, but I realize, I appreciate this is, at the moment, the best available piece of kit for doing mobile journalism. Um, and why do I say that? Mostly it's because the, the magic is in the editing. And there are no decent editing apps for Android phones. All the good editing apps are, are made for the iPhone model. Um, I'll take you back to, to September 2008. Uh, I was visiting a daily newspaper in <coughs> Geelong, telling the editor-in-chief about this um, this wonderful thing. And he said, if it's so good, prove it. So I went down, and the, the person, the football jumper, was a star of a, of a local team or in the grand final. I know nothing about football, but I agreed to do the story anyway. Went down there. There was a media scrum. The deal was the player would come out of the shed, would make a statement to the, to the media scrum, would take one or two questions the, to make the TV cameras happy, and then back into the shed. The rule was no individual interviews. Not possible, not, not forbidden, not going to happen. He had a minor on each side of him. Back into the shed. And as he's walking back into the shed, I just came alongside with my then Nokia N96 or, or 95, I think it was. And I streamed, I, I did the right thing ethically, I introduced myself. I'm from the local paper, and I, he probably thought I was taking a photograph of him. And, and a photographer happened to snap me, which is how I got my evidence of the fact I need to lose a bit of weight. <laughs> Hasn't changed much. <laughs> um, the, the, the point is that he, he thought I was just taking a photograph, but I streamed some live, uh, about 20 seconds of live video back to the, back to the website of the newspaper before the, uh, <clears throat> before the miners caught me and took me away. So I discovered in this that, that there are lots of good things and bad things about, about mobile journalism. The good things, I think, you'd agree, very easy to use, 
very discreet. You can keep it in your pocket and pull it out. Um, I'll show you an app later on that I've used a lot um, for, for not undercover, but for discreet videoing because it looks as though you're reading a, a book on your iPhone, but you're actually filming. Um, I have, I, I still, you know, it's a good thing I've been thrown out of a few casinos in Macau where it's forbidden to film, but I did get some footage from there using this particular app. Um, it's always connected. If you've got a Wi-Fi device, uh, I'll show you my, I carry this Wi-Fi device with me at all times. So I've got, I've got a 4G connection anywhere in this country, provided there is a 4G signal. Yeah, we've got 4G. Always connected. Um, the public don't seem to worry. If, if I produce a big, large camera, people will start to perform. People will regard me as a TV person, and they will do something. Yeah. Whereas with a phone, it's just a sort of, if I take out my phone, people don't seem to bother if I'm filming. That's what happened at that demonstration yesterday. There were so many people shooting video and photographs that nobody noticed um, another person doing it. And it's kind of cool. Yeah. You'll find, I think that's one thing you'll, you'll accept by the end of the day. It's kind of cool. The bad things I'll talk about after the after I've shown you the, the software. Um, if we had a projector, um, I'd show you. This is a guy called um, uh, Robert Hall. When I worked at ITN in '88, he was my reporter. We used to work in teams, reporter in the field, producer back in the office, and he was my field reporter. And so he's moved to, to the BBC. And he's always been a bit of a, a techie. And in 2007, there's a place called Chandler's Crossing, which is somewhere south of London, where there'd been a, a bank robbery. And he and he, showed, he sent me this video of, of him recreating the, the event. And this is a picture of, of what it looked like on screen. Uh, if, if I had, on my laptop, I can actually show you the piece of video. But it's really crap. That's the point I want you to see. This is a... If you saw this video, you'd say, oh, it's really, really crap. And it is, but that was 2007. We've got a thing called Huang's Law. So Dr. Huang uh, recently retired as the chief scientist of Samsung in South Korea. And they named his law after him. Just as they named Moore's Law after Gordon Moore, the guy who invented, who founded Intel. Uh, Moore's Law says that the the, grunt, the brains of computers double in capacity roughly every 18 months. Huang's law says the same thing about the brains of mobile phones, except it's about every nine months, which is why we can bring out a new model of, of mobile phone roughly every year, and that's what that will do. So if we take this 2007, apply Huang's law, and then take now and apply Huang's law to another five years from now, who knows what you'll be able to do with your mobile phone. Right now, anybody who's doing this stuff is still considered a bit of a pioneer. Um, though recently it's, it's taken off. Um, Gannett, which is the biggest newspaper chain in the United <coughs> States, just went out and bought 1,200 iPhones with, and with iMovie installed uh, for their reporters. So they've dis discovered that this is the way to go. Um, the new 24-hour news channel that the Evening Standard Group in London and much as anything else, um, Latest TV, which is the community station in Brighton, I'm training them and using um, mobile phones because the cost is so limited. And it also allows you to involve the news in the world. So one of the points we've got in Brighton is to train so-called citizens. There are lots of people who have been in their work that are with the iPhones in the training. Yeah, so, if I were to show you this, you could still have really all the qualities that we know that it wants to. It's a long time ago, but you know what I was trying to tell you. You know what I was trying to tell you, but you know what I was trying to tell you. There are two forms of motor, basic and full. Um, to summarize it, the basic form 
So you have control of it. So if you're a freelancer, you can sell it, which is an important factor. Um, if you want, I'm happy to send Paul a copy of this um, presentation. I mean, you can put it on a thumb drive or something. Um, now, the basic way is theories and learn you can do on the phone. So the other problem requires, I'd say, well, for me, it took a full day. You guys, maybe a couple of hours. Um, let's talk about the university. Um, there's a question that we're going to do. And they were the two senior speakers, um, Erica and, and Brian. I, I don't know how much you know about the system. Of, in America. So these were final year students and a couple of months from graduation. In America, if you get a job, you work on some tiny, tiny TV station in backwoods, Kentucky or wherever. And then after five years, you move to a, a bigger station. And then maybe five more years later, you get a job in a capital city station somewhere. And eventually, when you're 40, you get to go to Washington or Los Angeles or um, or New York, yeah? Erica went straight to CBS in New York. Why? Because she had the skills that they wanted. Now, Brian decided to become an academic, so he went to Oxford and was just, just graduating now. But we did some testing. Um, oh, um, Brian also did, and again, I can't show you this, but this is, a, this is an example of a 2010 slideshow that he did from a place called Whistler Mountain. So he literally went up to the mountain, um, made this slideshow, and, and broadcast it from his mobile phone back to the newsroom. Didn't involve the two-hour drive to get back to do the editing. And we did some research about, uh, we covered elections and, <laughs> and, and tested this stuff. And essentially, we proved that in terms of time, it's faster, half the time to actually make a, a slideshow. <laughs> and we also proved it's cheaper. These are 2010 prices, but roughly a third of the price as well. So that's another key factor if you're trying to talk to business managers at newsrooms. Again, I'm, I'm happy to you know, have a copy of this. Um, closer to home, uh, one of my, uh, he's now a former PhD student because he's just submitted, a guy called Evo, um, worked with some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island students, kids in, in the Northern Territory and uh, of Australia, right up in the top. There were, uh, how many were there? One, two, three, four, five, six. There were nine of them. <coughs> All of these kids, that were kids to me, uh, were undereducated. They left school around about 14 or 15, didn't have a job, and there was a government scheme to get them trained in something. So Evo trained these kids. A year later, seven of them were working as for either the ABC or SBS, the two national broadcasters, because they had these skills. So I'm banging on a bit about this, but I'm, my point is I'm assuming you guys are looking for a job when you when you graduate. Yeah, this is a skill that makes you gives you that dreadful unique selling point on USP on your CV. God, I'm using if I use any more acronyms, <laughs> your USP on your CV. Yeah. And he also, uh, that's uh, this is the video you can look at. If you look up um, in the resources section at the end, I'll show you a couple of links of places to go to look at videos on this. Um, we also worked on a thing called My School Mojo, which is teaching high school kids, again, ones who are not doing too well at school, 
And it's amazing how they pick up this sort of stuff. And um, when I was running this uh, communication school in China, uh, I brought in that's Evo there. You can see the tall guy. And we we, um, we took ten students and four staff, trained fourteen of them, and then set up nuts, the Nottingham University television station, using um, seven of these Mojo kits, which I I had the first string so I could buy them, which was nice. The one nice thing about being the boss is you get to have the budget. You've got to go to dreadful, boring meetings, but you get to control the budget. That's one thing. So I'll show you the kit. I mean, most of you can see there's a, a light, quite a powerful light. It won't, it won't shine in your eyes. And the nice thing is it's got all these um, fittings on the side, so you can just lock others, so you can actually build an array of as many as you like. So a light, a microphone. They chose to go the monopod way. I, I use a, um, a little tripod, um, a bag, and, uh, and there's a thing, a frame called a bubo, uh, which I'll talk, I'll show you a little later on. It, it's, I don't particularly like using it, but um, the students liked it because it was, uh, essentially the, the phone locks into the middle frame. And it gives you more stability when you're, when you're holding it. Um, I've just trained myself to use the phone only. And I'll talk about that in a little while. But we bought these seven kits for under $1,000 US per kit. So for $7,000, we had seven, we were running a, a new service, a web based, um, web, a new service for the university. For, for, and you can't beat that. That sort of price is dirt cheap. So $1,000 is what, 700 quid roughly? Yeah. So for 700 quid, you, but you really, as I said, you can get away with just this or, or, the, or an iPad, provided you've got electricity. Um, the kit came from a company called Vericorner. So, and, and they sell these things. That's the, the Bubo I mentioned. So you can see the phone, and it locks into the back of the, and it's got a, a better quality lens. It improves the quality of the imagery on the Instead of the phone lens, you've got a better quality lens on the on the Google. Um, it's now been it's now been renamed the M Cam Light. But if you want to go to store.verycorder.com, there are an American that was stolen your. You better take that before I see it. Recorder. Um, I'll talk about them later on. They're a really interesting software company in Canada who. Uh, are pioneers of this stuff in terms of writing the apps. Um, oh, isn't it? This is a piece of video I shot of it in Seoul of a, a student using the Bubo and demonstrating how she does it. No, she's got the camera up here, so she's still looking. So she's got the she's still looking at the person. So if, you, if we're talking, it's sort of like this, and microphone down here. So it's possible. It's a bit. Strange at first, but you can. It's quite easy to do after a while. Um, and this is so good that a what's his name? I forgot his name. Chan Woo Park, a very famous South Korean director, may be called Paran Manjang. A horror movie runs for 31 minutes, I seem to remember, and it's won several awards at various uh, film festivals. And he did, did it entirely with iPhone 4, in fact, back then. Uh, they were donated by a Korean, a Korean telecom. How did he do it? Well, basically, he cheated. He bolted on these really serious $20,000 lenses onto the Google. <laughs> and that's the great thing. If <clears throat> any of you, any of you um, photographers from an early life and you've still got your lenses, well, the nice thing about the Bubo, you buy the Bubo and it's got these fittings, so you can you can put your old lenses onto, provided they're Nikon or Canon, you can put them onto your the Bubo, so you're not wasting your lens. You still got you can still recycle your lens. So welcome to the Mojo Revolution. I've done enough talking. I think I'm going to do some more demonstration.
these are the most basic forms, but I think the better way to do it would be to show you. So that's Google Capture. That's quick. That's what I'm going to show you. iMovie. That's Vodio, and that one on the far end is the, is the one that looks like a like a reading book. I'm not. I'm not filming. So I'm just reading a just reading a book. Look. If you can see the little 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 blob just here. Oops. See that little round circle there? That's your recording. <laughs> it's brilliant. You can get away with all sorts of stuff. <laughs> and you can change the interface to it. You can make it look like a spreadsheet if you're doing your, if you're doing your, your taxation guide or something. So it's a really cool piece of software, only a couple of quid. Um, Vodio, any of you use uh, Final Cut Pro? Yeah. Yeah. You know it's fairly complicated to learn. Well, Vodio is the Final Cut Pro of the, of the app world. It's the one made by that software company in Canada I mentioned, very good. It's brilliant, but it takes three days probably to learn properly. It's complicated. Whereas iMovie, which I'll show you, you can learn in a couple of hours or under an hour, depending on how. And the point is you can't break this. You can push some buttons. You're not going to break anything. And quick, I think I mentioned, that's the one that um, where the software is provided for free, but the, soft, but the video goes to the website of the, of the company. So I'll show you. Um, I'm going you need sign for this button. Just one more. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll get one. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I think this is the video we did last night, so I'll, I'll do a. Do another one. Start, start from scratch. So I'll delete that and we'll start again. New project, new movie. You first of all, you get a series of templates. They offer immediately. And because um, some of you have heard of CNN I report which is CNN's way to encourage the audience to, to contribute free content. Well, um, Apple have designed a template. So if you're working for CNN, I report this is the one you use. So I avoid that one. And I tend, I'll go with a simple one. Yeah. So I create movie. Um, are there any like uh, in-app purchases or more? Um, like um, um, I'm sure somebody's, you know, I haven't looked, but I'm sure that um, there are actually, uh, as this stuff evolves, I think you'll find more and more companies building um, special effects, slow mo, all that sort of stuff. So I'm about, there's bound to be more templates here. I almost guarantee it, but I haven't, haven't looked, so I kind of. Question. Um, so you can see it's three parts of the screen. There's what's in my video, my previous pieces of video. If I tap on the, the button the next one, you probably can't see it. It's, it's my all my photos. So I've got all my photos that I've taken. And if I tap on the third button over here, it's more all the audio. So I've got theme music if I want it. I've got sound effects if I need them. I've got um, albums. So if I need to, I can I can find music that's stored on my iPad. And uh, one of the things I mentioned last night is that uh, <clears throat> if I need music, it's very easy. My son composes music. You know, it's a hobby. So if I need a piece of music, I simply email him and say, I'm, I'm making a, a video about X. Uh, last year I went to Cambodia. I did a documentary about the killing fields, the, the Holocaust Museum there. And I needed a really sad piece of piano. So he, he created a piece of piano music and emailed it to me. I dropped the email into my into my into my iPhone or iPad and that became the theme music for my for my documentary. He gets a credit in the, in the end and didn't charge me on the complaint. That's what that's a nice thing about family. <laughs> so I've got music. 
I've got photos, I said I've got video. If you want to preview a piece of video, you literally just um, tap the video once. You see it's got little yellow bars around it, with active, and there are a series of buttons you can press. If I press this one here, I can actually play the video. And you can actually see it here if you want to preview it. If you're happy with it, you press the, the button to the left, this one here, which just means it, it drops that piece of video down into my work area. So down the, so the bottom area is where I work. So I've got a piece of video. I've got an interview who I did earlier, so I'll drop that in. Um, I've got something from last night. I'll use that as well. Um, I'll put in a photograph. And if you drop in a photograph, it automatically makes it run for five seconds. You can you can shorten the length from that. And it does what's is it, what was that Civil War documentary? A very famous Civil War documentary where the guy made a documentary about using old photographs of the Civil War, and he made it look as a movie because he kept moving the camera around the photographs. And that's been given a name now, named after the director. It's called the something effect. Anyway, that's what happens with these things. Yes, so you, oh. it actually gives you the Ken Burns effect when you when you play the piece of, when you play the photograph. Notice it sort of does a Ken Burns effect on the, and you can re, you can you can. Decide where that's going to be if you want. You can actually control that. So I've got my raw material, and so we've assumed we've been out in the field. We've shot our, our piece of video. Um, what I could do, of course, is add a little bit of extra video if you don't mind. Do I have permission to, to shoot you guys in here? Okay. The video as my video. Revenge. <laughs> okay. So that's now I go back to my movie to find that piece of video is the most recent in the list. So there you guys are. You say mathematically you use the iPad because it's easier, um, but presumably you can still do all this on the iPhone. Yes, you? yeah. The only reason I prefer the iPad is the battery life. I mean, remember I talked about the downsides? One of them is the battery life. I can get a full day's work out of an iPad battery. I can't have this. So you basically use that to shoot and then obviously with the storage you just access That's another option. The you can, you can yeah. shoot with one and copy onto the other using these little connector devices. Yeah. Um, but that's the main reason, the battery life. The other one is for me is I, I'm, my fingers slip on, on the small screen. I prefer editing on here. It just gives me less room for error. <laughs> I make too many mistakes when I'm editing on here. I make movies on here all the time, but given a choice, I go for the yeah. iPad. But that's personal. Some of you may prefer to use this. Do you find any difference in the response that obviously filming someone like Martin for Yeah, um, hmm. I don't think that makes too much difference. I think if I had this big one, it might. Yeah. But I think I can get away with the discrete part of the two tiny ones. Yeah. Good question. Does the iPad um, uh, iMovie specifically allow you to edit this MP4s, or is it just MOV files? I'm sorry, so I think my hearing's concerned. Oh, sorry. Uh, the iMovie on the iPad, does it allow you to edit um, MP4s, or is it just um, MP4 files, or is it just MOV files? MOV. Yeah. But I'm. Good question. I don't it's know not, The reason I ask basically is because I've got an Android phone which has a good camera on it, mm -hmm. but um, I've also. pads which has a oh, so you're it. thinking of shooting with your Android phone? Yeah, yeah. And I've got Dropbox yeah. and both, so it just pops up that Give way. it a try. I, I, I suspect it probably would work because these things are pretty mm -hmm. adaptable. Okay. Give it a try. Yeah. That saves you having to buy a new phone. <laughs> um, can I just ask this iMovie app? 
Is it like markedly different from like the iMovie that would be on a MacBook yes. Pro? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't like iMovie on on the laptop. Yeah, I thought it looked really it's different. It's very different. But and funny enough, is it? The, the, uh, even though when you buy the app, it, it copies one. When you when you buy the app off the iTunes Store um, and copy it onto your phone and your iPad, even though you only pay for it once, it actually is two different packages. So you'll find that you can do more editing wise. Maybe that's the third reason I prefer the the iPad. You can actually do more editing tricks on here than you can on here. Um, one of the things is that you, with the iPhone, you don't get this preview screen. You've got to tap to go somewhere else to see it. I'll show you what I mean. So you can see at the moment I've got my work area, my previous stuff, and, and, and my preview screen here. Yeah? If I go back to iPhone app, You'll see that on the on the iPhone version, when it comes up, come on, it only has the work area down here, and you have to tap to get. So you've got your tools. You have to tap to get. So one piece of video, I've got to tap here to get the video that I've got. And I, so if I want a piece of video, I drop it in, and it drops into my work area. So you, it's slightly different in the way it works. And I prefer, I personally prefer number four now as to why I prefer working with the iPad. But you get used to this one very quickly as well. You can cross between the two. Um, Stephen, have you ever found that when you've been recording a, a news story that you've not been taken seriously because you've got an iPhone and not a big camera? I find that an advantage. If I'm not being taken seriously, I can get away with things. Yeah. That kind of happened to me the other day. So mm. that's why. Oh. Mm. Yeah. Um, I have a mate who's a television news camera, and he's got a big camera and a little camera, a little an iPhone. And he says when he's interviewing politicians and people who can take themselves seriously, he always produces the big camera to make the mass out of the ego. <laughs> yeah. But for everybody else, he's quite happy to use the iPad on the phone. Okay, so I've got my, my my video in here. So we can assume you've just left the scene, you've, you've found a coffee shop away from where you've just been doing your shooting. And I used to irritate my colleagues in Hong Kong because that's what I do. I go out of the job, I film, I find a coffee shop, I order a big bowl of Gloria Jean coffee, which is in a large size, it was about 15 minutes worth. <laughs> and they gave me just enough time to edit my. And then I. I filed the story up to, uh, to a secure site in, in Vimeo or YouTube, and then I phone my colleague and say it's, it's there. Okay, some else. And I used to hate the fact that I didn't have to go back to the office <laughs> because you waste so much time travelling unless you can edit. And the South Terminal we go through such cheap skirts that they insist we use public transport. So I, and you can't edit on a, on a crowded bus or, or tube in, the, in Hong Kong. It's just, just impossible. There's too many people. Whereas in the good old days, you could sit in the back of a taxi and do your editing and went back to the studio. They wouldn't, they wouldn't wear this. OK, so if I, I'm now down in my work area here, yeah? So you can see that as I scroll across, you can see that. So let's just say I want to start my video about here because I recognize the Trafalgar Square here. So I tap, tap the, and it's got the little yellow lines around it, so it means it's active. I just slide, slide, swipe my finger down that middle line, I just cut. Yeah. And I double click that and delete it. So I've now, now starting here. Yeah. That's how easy it is to cut your video. If you want, if you've made a mistake, there's an undo button here, so I can just get it back again. Another option is you grab the yellow bar and drag that. So you're just shrinking it down. It's another way of editing 
It's a, so you've got two choices. The important thing is you haven't lost the original. It's only a copy, so even if you make a mistake. So I want to start about, about here. Yeah. Use that. So here's my start point. And oh no, I don't like that bit of muck on the end there, so I'm going to remove that. So that's my so I've now got tells me I've got eight point three seconds of so my opening shot is 8.3 seconds. I, I can cut it back if I want to make it, say we'll cut it back to 7 seconds. Yeah, that's, that's my opening shot, yeah? So I'm going through this quite quickly. So what I've got various options. I can, if I want to add a title, I need to delete that and then I'll just call this test. I'll do it a couple of times. Test. Pretty clever typing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so now when I play the video, my location super comes up. Where was the uh, button or whatever you could click on the so you insert the text. Ah, um, there's, oh, if you can see it down the bottom here, you can't see it on the screen, but it says title. So you literally just tap the title button. Oh, okay. All the instructions, the menu, the menu is across the bottom of the, uh, the screen, if you can see it. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So if you choose audio, you get the audio menu. Choose video, you get the video menu. And it's, it, as I said, you can't break it, and it's quite. Also, uh, change the speed. You can do slow mo or fast mo. It's uh, you can you can do freeze frames. It's got a whole lot of special effects built in as well, which is really clever. Say hi. Yes. So I've now got um, I've got my opening credit, opening title, and my opening shot. And so what I like about this, <clears throat> in the good old days when I did television journalism, we used to do the script first and then cut the pictures around the script, which is really cumbersome, but it was forced by the technology. This way is so much better. You cut the pictures first and then add the voiceover afterwards. And the reason I say that is that essentially this is in each of these is a discrete block of a video here. Yeah? Each of them is a distinct duration. So I know that this first piece is seven seconds. And we work on roughly three words a second. The mathematicians among us will tell us that we need how many words? 21. 21, yeah. So that's, I mean, I don't need to even type a script for that. I can pretty well make up a script for 21 words. And the point is, you don't need loose sentences. That's for print journalism. With this, you just use phrases. And what you're doing is telling people what's not obvious from the pictures. Yeah. So we've got some pictures here. Um, you might put location in your title, you know, view from one or something. But you, so you, the trick here is to add something in your, in your voiceover script that's more than what's in the pictures. Yeah. So um, in this case, I'm at a wine. I'm, I'm at a wine tasting meeting a, a wine maker. So if I tap the voice script, it, it, it gives me the option now to record a voice track. I press. First of all, I think about what I'm going to say. I'm in front of a group of students. I'm going to make sure I don't make any stupid mistakes. <laughs> okay. So. It's a head sound effect. You see, it's counting me in. Um, here we are in London. I'm about to meet winemaker Nick Mills. It then gives me the options of cancelling it, retaking it if I really make a mistake, uh, reviewing it, so I can review it. If we had sound, you'd hear my voice, or I can just accept it. And I've just accepted it, and there's my recording. And you can see. 
from the way it sounds that there is voice. And if you want to, you can tap on here and change the volume. Okay? Notice how the, the waveform goes up and down. So if, if my voice was a bit soft, I could artificially bump it up. So I've now got my, my, um, my opening credits, uh, my voiceover that it talks about, and that leads me into the interview. So we've got the interview, blah, blah, blah. Again, I would need to put a title on here to identify the person who's being interviewed. Yeah, so make up a name for him. So as he comes on, we hear his voice. We get a subtitle, a caption. Again, I might bump his voice up or down depending on what it's like. And that's essentially how we edit the stuff. How good is that multi tracking if you uh, want to say yep, audio yep, from one yep, player? Good, good question. Let's say I want to insert a piece of audio in here. I've got a, a range of options. If I go back to his video, there's, so there's three three dots at the end there. If I touch that button, it gives me the choice of, of separating just the audio or putting video on top of video. I'll show you a couple of examples. So it means I can have that. I can split the screen. So I can have that. So lots and lots of special effects for a three pound app. <laughs> All right, as I said, I can separate the audio. So I, so I, I continue with his. So I show you this piece of video. So we see the video, but his voice is playing underneath. So it's got all sorts of possibilities. You can be really creative. And of course, I forgot to mention, if you wanted to, you could add some sound effects. So let's say, as these two fine students come in, we choose to sound effects. We um, Clock ticking. So I can now have sound effects as well. And if I want to, I can add a further voice, uh, music track as well. But that's probably getting a bit too complicated. <laughs> so I don't know how, I mean, once you've got these skills and, and you learn very quickly because it's so intuitive, the buttons are all obvious, you could be making a video. You could be editing a video in about, probably your first one won't take more than about half an hour. So, so we're going to go back to the presentation to show, make a few theoretical points. Because, so as I said, I've broken this iMovie thing into, into six parts. The first part is just basic preparation. You arrange your interviews. You find out where you've got to go to meet the people, all that sort of stuff, but every journal stuff's automatically. So essentially it's research. It's the preparation before you go to the shoot. And then you go to a location. And this is the fun thing about being a TV journalist, you get out of the office. I used to hate working in, um, in newspapers sometimes because you spend a little time doing your interviews on the phone. This way at least you get out. You get to enjoy some sunshine or rain or whatever. So you need an establishing shot, a long shot. You take stills as well as video, because you can drop stills into your packages. What I tell people is that if you're working in web-based news, your product is only going to be short. It's going to be a minute 
80 seconds, 90 seconds. So for 90 seconds of video, you don't need two hours of filming, do you? You need probably five to 10 minutes of good video. So what I tell people, review after each, each time you take a photograph, review it, look at it on your phone. It does burn up your battery more quickly, but it's worth it. And if it's a crap photograph, delete and take it again. If that's a crap one, delete and take it again until you're happy with it. And the same thing with your when you shoot your video. Shoot a piece of video, check it out. If it's no good, delete it and just do it again. And you work in short pieces. Remember, most because we're editing, you don't need to, to shoot a panorama for 15 minutes. Just 15 seconds is enough. 15, 10, 20, probably 30 seconds might be the longest piece of shooting you'll take. Because you're going to, editing is a process of cutting it into little sections anyway. A typical one minute news piece is probably going to be eight, nine, ten sections. So you don't need to have long pieces of video. So when you're in the field shooting, you've got to be quite disciplined and keep it down to probably eight to ten minutes of field work for the one minute or one and a half minutes of the product. Um, the only thing, and most of the time, I'll go on to tips as well. So, um, a couple of pieces of advice. The digital lens on this is, a, is not very good when you, if you move too quickly. So, better to, to, to remain still, so resist the urge to pan and tilt, and basically better to hold the camera steady and let the action come into the U frame and out again. It aesthetically looks good too. You've got somebody entering, and as they leave the frame, that's when you press the stop button. It's a nice discipline to get into, because that's three or four seconds as they come and go. And that looks good on screen. Aesthetically, is pleasing to the eye. Entry points, exit points. Um, use places where people congregate. If you need a crowd, find a crowd, and just leave the camera there and let the crowd come in, in and out. That looks just as effective as trying to follow a crowd. Or use escalators, uh, glass fronted lifts. All those things give you different angles without having to move the camera because the machine is doing movement for you. Uh, if you do need to, to move the camera, you make your body in the tripod. And that's essentially feet about shoulder width apart lock your elbows in and use your body as the as the device. Somebody uh, uh, tweeted about my sniper reference last night. Was it? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a friend who used to be a, uh, a sniper uh, saw service, so I don't talk too much about it. But essentially when you when you shoot somebody from a long distance, you've got to be very accurate and the way you do it is by controlling your breathing. So you take a breath Hold and then squeeze. If you, it's the same thing with filming. So if you need to do some filming, um, take a, a deep breath. I can hold my breath for 15 seconds and get a steady, without too much shaking. If you start to shake, you better make sure you breathe. <laughs> How would you do your uh, piece to camera? Would you reverse uh, the? Um, you know, uh, if you take your camera out, there's a little apple on the back. Yeah. Yeah. So if you put the camera on and and hold it arm full arm length and if you frame your head into the apple, that's perfect. Yeah. It's pretty well it's gonna get it. The only thing is you don't do it yeah. too long because your arm's gonna get a bit wonky and shaky. Yeah. So you might need to rest your arm on something. But yeah, if your face is in the apple You've got a, you've got a good, fairly good composition. It's good tricks. Don't try to use the reverse camera. It's crappy. It's a bit of use the front camera. Good question. Um, if you're going to do interviews, uh, a formal interview, or sit down with somebody, then it's probably best to, uh, you know, arrange. Sorry, I'm too high for this, but we're on the same height. You set up your camera close by here, so it looks as though the person's, so you, it's, it's quite natural. So I have a camera about here locked on a, a table or something, 
And don't be afraid to get people to move around. The you know, people who are being interviewed are quite happy to be shifted and sat down a bit. But you tell them, you know, you look better over here in this life or something like that. But you can set up your camera, press record, and then you, you can just have the interview without having to worry about any of the technical stuff. Um, and that's where, that's where this is better for interviews because you can just lock it in place and away you go. Um, I have done interviews with um, with this. Um, it just means that I hold it when I do the interview. I'm basically sitting or talking or standing with the person. And I've got the camera around about. I don't want to block my mouth, so I've got it about my chin level, and I look the person in the eye. So we're doing the interview, having a conversation, but the camera's running, and I tell them, you know, just looking, look me in the eye, try to ignore this. And just have a conversation. It's not as good as doing a formal sit down with a tripod, but it, it can work. Um, a, a final tip if you do um, video somebody against, say, against a wall or something, let's say you decide I want to video them against this nice, nice white background. You don't put them here. You get them to stay at least a meter away from the wall. Because if you film somebody against the wall, you get this funny flatness behind them. So you've got to get them to come out at least a meter. And then you're about a meter away from there. It just looks better. Screen. Uh, and sound, of course, sound is important. You've got various options. If you want to get good sound, the microphone in the... Uh, and the iPhone is very good, provided you're about this far away, sort of half a meter to a meter away. If I tried to interview Paul from this angle, he's too far away, his voice would fade away. So you're going to use either a, a microphone or um, one of those chip on ones. And there's a, a Rode ROG, you make a really good one. It's about a price a couple of days ago for £35. It's really good. Just, one end goes in here, and the other end just clips onto the the, uh, the collar of the person you're interviewing, and you get really good sound. The inbuilt sound and that picks up a lot of background noise, doesn't it? Yeah, that's where um, choosing the location for the interview is very important. So you want place with ceiling. You don't want hard walls because you get too much bounce of, of sound noise. So you want a quiet place. And yeah, that's the distinction between doing a print interview and a Broadcast interview, you've got to find a, a broadcast, you've got to find the best location for the sound. Right? So, um, yeah, you've just got to find something. And that's why you should always arrive early to check out the location to find the best place to take the person afterwards. You don't want to say, can I have an interview with you? And then, hang on a second, I've got to find somewhere. You've got to know where it is before you can arrange the interview. Yeah. Yeah, um, the, the microphone is very good, it's very high quality. And you'll notice that when you do your voice, I just I do my voice just talking to the microphone like this, and it's perfectly good quality. Okay. Um, so that's that's the shooting, and then as I said, try to do your editing on location. The reason for that is if you do discover you're missing a piece of good video, you can always nip back to the location and shoot that extra. 30 seconds or whatever. But the editing is, is the magical part, as you saw, on, as I demonstrated. It really is amazing. You, you will feel, you will chuckle after a while. You will think, oh, this is really cool. Because it's so, you can be really creative and, and it's faster than anyone yeah. So you need an opening image, obviously. You need an opening shot, just like with any piece of print journalism. You want to have a nice, catchy introductory sentence. If you want a nice, grabby opening image. I did a story uh, um, when we had the year of the snake in Hong Kong, I remember. Um, I needed some images of snakes. And I went to a mall where they had a couple of slinky models with snakes curled around them. It's just a promotional stunt. And the best thing about it, I just, I just found a, just a quiet area and I provoked the snake in a nice way. So it came towards me, and I got this wonderful opening shot of the snake coming at me and filling the screen of the... Um, luckily, there was a glass wall between me and the snake. 
<laughs> and it was an interesting story because like, these models, they were trying to look cool as the snakes were twirling around, but they were obviously quite scared. So it made a nice little story of the year of the snake. So you need an opening image, um, you need an opening title. Sometimes opening titles can be supplied by a still you take of the organization. So if you're doing a story about the Bank of England, then you, you take a photograph of the of the, you know, the title of the Bank of England, or if you're doing a story about the City University, you'd have a, a photograph of the university logo on the in the title. So that's often a way to get a nice opening image and a title combined. Um, duration is always the issue. You're probably not going to do more than a minute and a half. I Sometimes when I recommend when you're starting off to a storyboard, you just after you've previewed your your stills and your video, you'll you'll sort of make, make a note. Okay, I'll have, that'll be my opening image. I'll, I'll have a still here. I'll have the interview here. I'll have the so you basically plot it out in a linear sequence. And then all you've got to do is just once you've got the the storyboard on a scrap of paper, you just drop it into that timeline you saw down here. And it, it happens very quickly, and then you and then you uh, you you need a nice sexy closing shot if possible, and obviously credits over a bit of black at the end, produced by, scripted by, and you choose the wording. Um, voiceover, I've done a, a little bit. Are you going to script the voiceover? You don't really need to script it. You can do it in your head after a while. Remember, each block of a video is a duration of a certain number of seconds. Multiply by three, that's your maximum number of words. I tend to, to go under the maximum by a couple, couple of words anyway to allow a bit of breathing space between each piece. And you just basically insert the voiceover as the street blocks. Uh, short phrases, you don't need professional sentences, short phrases, and obviously practice. But that's the beautiful, beautiful thing about the software. It allows you to practice. If you don't like it, you just retake it. Keep playing it until you get it right. And you need a quiet place. Um, I, somebody laughed, hopefully. This is a photograph of a friend in a hotel room trying to find a quiet place. You just basically pull the duvet cover every step while he's doing his voiceover. Another place I've told, mentioned before is a, a, clo a closet, clothing, where, where clothing is. You can go in there and do your voiceover because the muff. All the extraneous sound is muffled by the, by the coats and shirts and jackets around them. Um, captions. Yeah, essentially, you need a title at the beginning, or as I said, use a still or a sign or a logo. You need to identify everybody you interview. And in a one minute pitch, you probably want probably two interviews as nice as possible. And then at the end, your credit, you give yourself a credit at the end, um, copyright your company or for a freelancer or whatever. And then the last stage, you finished it, and now, so you then I recommend you save your finished video to the camera roll, which is the memory, the camera memory on your phone, and then you upload via your Wi-Fi device to wherever you're going to send it, your YouTube account, your Vimeo account or the secure place. The nice thing about Vodio is they give you a secure place to send all your, but they charge you for it. The problem. They charge you a data rate, and it's quite expensive. It's about £60 a month. Can you use uh, editing software without that server? Uh, no, software. it's all part of the package. No. Yeah. So they give you the software for 10 quid, I think it is. But they make their money in charging you for all the peripherals, the secure location for your video, the data services and stuff like that. So increasingly I'm, I'm using iMovie as my preference. Because you've got Apple's a big company, they're going to develop, they've, they've stopped updating Final Cut Pro, they seem to be focusing more and more on iMovie, so that means they're obviously going to put some energy and in staffing into, so it's going to get better and better. Um, the current version is, is only the second version. It's still, I think it's very impressive for what they give you. Do you think it makes much difference what generation of iPhone you're using? Um, only the, the more the more recent the camera, more recent the phone, the better the camera generally. That's the so that's the only factor for me. Yeah. Um, you can save, and the great thing about um, the current version of iMovie, you can save it in 
uh, it's the big format, 1920 by 1080. So that's that's a significantly impressive piece of uh, imagery. The downside is, of course, it's a large file. So when you do start, and this is the part that used to piss me off most because I was on 3G in Hong Kong. So a one minute video would probably take 15 minutes to upload. So it took as long to upload as it did to edit, which is crazy. With 4G, it's going to be better, um, or Wi-Fi. Um, but just be aware, roughly one second of video is one meg of size. So it's a minute's video is 60 megs. That's a big file um, for a uh, for 3G to grunt with. So with 4G, I, I haven't I haven't done, done a test recently, but I would imagine 4G is going to be faster. But that's you have to accept that your video is pointless until you've got it to a destination where somebody can look at it. Um, and now I want to talk about those issues we mentioned before. So there's some good things. There's also some bad things. So the lens. The lens, if you keep it in your pocket or your handbag, the lens is possibly going to get mucked up. It's a little bit bloggy. So you've got to clean the lens. Carry a cloth in your back pocket and clean your lens or use your shirt or blouse or whatever to clean your lens because it's the number one cause of Nothing worse than shooting a great piece of video and seeing this hair through the middle of it. Um, we've talked about the battery life. Uh, so yeah, the battery life is awful. <laughs> this is a photograph I got sent from Haiti. You can see that. It's people Ooh, desperate for electricity. <laughs> um, so you need a battery charger. Um, this is the one I use. It's uh, it was about 65, 70 quid from memory, but it's um, it's 10,000 milliamps. It means I can charge my phone three times at least with you know just with a regular recharge cable out in the field. Um, that's saved my ass a few times. Don't buy those stupid Mophie things. That, you know the ones that sit in the Apple Store fits around your. It's a thousand milliamps point that gives you half a charge. And as it gets as it deteriorates, you're wasting your money. Much better off getting something with a bit of grunt to it. So you want at least four and five thousand milliamps, ideally ten thousand. You're not going to pay much extra for it, but you're going to get so much more benefit. Uh, I mentioned the lens. Um, and as I said, remember somebody's paying for the data charges. That's always what you've got to be aware of. So when I run these courses at schools and universities, when we have a sort of fun exercise, OK, flip chart, describe, where do you find free Wi-Fi? Make a list. And we brainstorm the class. Where do you go for free Wi-Fi? Because everybody knows, if you, if you live in a city, you know the city, you know where to go to get the free Wi-Fi. You've got to have some way of delivering your content from the field. Um, how much? Drum roll, please. So that's my original kit. Um, so still got the same um, battery charger. Uh, I've got a slightly larger Wi-Fi device. I've got a same light. This time I've got a little stand for it. I stole from Polly. I don't even mind it. Um, the phone that was an iPhone 4, um, the tripod, a microphone, um, and it, fit in, it fits into a, a, a container about that size. So that, that's an old, um, that was a water bottle cover. And they give you a free bottle of water in a five star hotel. I just liberated the cover. Mm -hmm. and that became my bag. So it all fits into a container about this size. You can't beat it in terms of mobility. And that was some um, 985 US dollars, so about what's that? 700 quid, roughly. Yeah. But really, what I increasingly, and certainly it's cheaper than that. So I'm a broadcast fan, <laughs> and much smaller than the kit. This is a kit from a, it was a TV crew without the cameras. 
Excuse my ignorance. What's the MiFi uh, device for? The MiFi device for? Oh, MiFi is so you've got Wi-Fi on, on in the field. So this this gives me a bubble of Wi-Fi uh, around me, and I think I can connect up with about five people on this. Okay. Um, I this is from Double E, one of the uh, UK companies. Um, ten pounds, eleven pounds, ten ninety nine a month for for five gig of data per month. Is um, I'm assuming that battery isn't an issue with that. Um, I also carry the charge of this. What I'm going to do is buy a, a spare battery. Um, it's good for a day. Battery's good for a day, but it's nice to have a backup battery. Uh, I invariably when I travel, I carry the. Have you ever really tried the solar battery? Ah, um, funnily enough, I've been looking at solar. There's a couple of companies that do solar batteries, but I don't know what it is, but they, they often may say it's not for the iPhone. Yeah. So if you know of a solar battery supplier that does iPhone, please let me know. Because that's been good. one thing I've noticed. There's a company called Nokero, N-E-C-K-E-R-O, which make brilliant solar battery devices. They sell them all around the world, but it says quite in the fine print, not for iPhone. Why? I don't know. Um, did you know, I discovered why, uh, I used to criticize Apple about why they locked the battery in. But I went to a seminar recently, and they told me it's for safety purposes. They say the battery's got so many gunky chemicals in it that if it breaks, it's potentially dangerous, which is why they lock it in the phone. That's what they tell me. I don't know how true it is. <laughs> <laughs> what about my life, Steve? You've obviously um, moved across to the 4G one. Um, I, I think I saw it was a little 3 one you had before. Yeah, the one I had before was 3G yeah. in Hong Kong. I got this 4G when I came. Is that significantly better? Yeah. Significantly, because that one is, I mean, it works and it depends where you are, but yeah. I just yeah. wonder how much different it was, because the um, price is quite good, because I mean, it's 10 quid for like. Or something like that. Um, yeah. I get five gig a month for, yeah. for 11 quid on this current plan. It's a two year contract. Sorry, one year contract. And I try to keep my contracts to one year because the technology is going to change. Um, right now, um, I still think that I'm happy with the iPad as my device. Why? Because batteries so much better. Camera is not too bad by comparison. Big screen allows me to do my editing. The software is better. The iMovie software is better than the iPad. And you can buy an iPad mini for £250. Unfortunately, they only seem to sell the 16 gig size. And that's well, it's okay for introductory stuff, but eventually, as you gather more and more digital video files, it's going to clog up your memory. You're going to end up having to delete. So I, um, I would recommend the iPad Mini as your device, but get as large a memory as possible. Ideally, 64 gig. But whether they sell them, I don't know, because I, when I went online a couple of days ago, um, I could only find the 16 gig model by, by the Apple Store. I did check this now, and they're they are 30 gigabyte um, versions. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if it's when you look at my mobile phone, I'll show you the best three models. Oh, great. Um, yeah, but you can also get the, the first two gigabyte models, which is not the most recent ones, but in test store. Ah, right. Okay. Right. So that's probably the last version. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, I am looking at the store, like I was on the phone. Um, so a couple of resources. Um, this book's now out of date, but it's a freebie on the web if you look up mobile journalism in the Asian region. Um, probably more useful is the delicious account which I maintain, which is like, everything I find out about Mojo, I just put it on a delicious account. Uh, the publisher doesn't want to do another edition, so I have to find a new publisher to do another, another book about Mojo. In this book, I'm mostly talking about Volio, and, and then 
once they brought out the new iMovie in late last year, um, I'm, I'm, iMovie's the way to go now. I don't use Vodio anymore as much. Um, my former student, Evo, has written an iBook called How to Mojo, which I'll show you in a few seconds. He's also got a very good YouTube site called How to Mojo. And um, all of the videos that he put into the iBook he's put on YouTube. And they're very good videos, good training videos. And of course, very cool that a software company that has the store with all the stuff. Um, and then um, there's a thing called the Basic Filmmaker Series, which are free videos, which are very, very good, at thebasicfilmmaker.com. And there's a YouTube site. Um, Eleanor commissioned a guy uh, called Felix to uh, to make a video, um, and that's on YouTube as well. Um, it's a bit um, complicated to remember, but um, it's very good. So when, when I send you the file, you can click on here and check it out. Um, so I'd like to finish with some questions to you guys. So once you've got this app on your iPhone and iPad, what are you going to do with it? And some examples. So I think you could make TV commercials with this stuff. You could make a living if you wanted to, making commercials for, for companies because it's so quick and so easy. You could you could do a com I'll do you a commercial for 100 quid. Go in, do um, edit and give it to them on the spot almost. Um, you could make PR promo films, I think. Um, some of my students in China, we started a series of mini documentaries, five minutes, about pollution in China. It was a bit tricky, but we found a website funded by the EU, so it's beyond the firewall, which is nice. And there are lots of short movie competitions you can enter. You can actually make movies, in fact, because it's called live movie. Um, and you can win, win prizes and money when these short movie competitions, there's several of them. Um, what by short, I mean five, six, seven minute movies. But obviously you need an actors and a script and stuff like that. But how else, and it's always worth asking a group of people, what do you, how else could you use this? These are some examples, but how else do you think you could, what could you do? Obviously you could do news stuff for, um, <clears throat> I've got thanks to the idea of your, you could set up a, uh, you can have an evening news bulletin where you send students out, each of them has to do one one minute video, and you've got a ten, ten student videos, ten minute bulletin in the evening with someone presenting it. Yeah, something that the, the French or German TV channel did after uh, is to uh, shoot, uh, for instance, uh, a music band in the street. And mm -hmm. In the case, it was Van Harper, right. <laughs> and but with um, from different angles with a smartphone, <gasps> and yeah. then they gather all the the videos mm -hmm. on the same page, you know, to add the, oh, uh, cool. the different angles mm -hmm. of the, the concert. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. In the street, yeah, in the street, not to do several takes of the of exactly. And then edit into, a, into yeah. a and video. one yeah. yes one page. Yeah, that would be brilliant. And yeah. you and you edit, you know, sometimes you have the maybe three or four only four three or four angles, and mm -hmm. then you have the other one mm -hmm. with some like this, yeah. and then everything together. Yes, that's a that's a great example. So the beautiful thing is that once you're familiar with the technology, which is easy, then you can do the creative stuff because creativity gets hampered if you if you're having worried about which button to push. Once you've worked it out how simple this stuff is, you can then let the creativity flow. That's a brilliant job. I'm still there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that for working as a professional tools and learn software like uh, Adobe Premiere or uh, Avid or something like that? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, I got to a stage in my life where I where I'm happy with this and I'm going to do this, but maybe for your career you might think that you need to have both. You know, I think it's not going to be one or the other, it's probably going to be both. 
Um, but that's another class, so I can't teach that. I can imagine not working with that sentence available throughout the. Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so now I have a problem of my PC. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, and yeah. what I do actually, should be with a mobile machine. <laughs> and then, and, and then you wait on the yeah. Yeah. That's um, there are companies around the world doing that as well. Yeah. You have more control in the editing process. This, I think, as I said right at the beginning, is, is really designed for speed, which probably implies news rather than longer forms. And I think it's brilliant for news. Have you already tried another brand, like the iPhone and iPad? Um, I I have in the past and I didn't enjoy them. Which one? You're not allowed to yeah, say. <laughs> I use it. Nokia Windows based phones really str I struggle with, and Nokia phones. I, I don't just me. I just I press I press the wrong button all the time. Mm -hmm. I just find this is more suited to my brain. But other people might find it, yeah. Maybe you prefer shooting with an Android and editing on something else. There's no right or wrong way of doing this. The important thing is to make stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so you find about the, the um, solar charger. Uh -huh. She says she's got Paramount, and it doesn't say not your own right. Okay. Could I read? I'll read it up. I'll, uh, mm, please. I'll read it up here as well. Okay. Thank you. I mean, actually, did a time lapse. Um, didn't you, Richard? Mm -hmm. mentioned in terms of an idea of a creative idea to the sort of point of the, um, the, the, the coffee um, shell upstairs mm -hmm. the third floor, so it's a coffee press on the third floor, which is a kind of report of the traffic around the oh, area. Yeah. Um, I don't know how easily you could do that with, um, with an old phone or an iPad, or you could do it with a camera. Yes, with the old camera because so of the so battery so problem. Oh, yeah, remember? Yeah, yeah. Because with the new camera, you have to change every 15 minutes. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So imagine <laughs> what you're going to do with the smartphone. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> On iPhone. <laughs> so even with the iPhone, you know, you need the plug at least yes. somewhere. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought I'd mention uh, this. I think is the future. This, this is a photograph from um, from Norway from late last year. There's this thing called live view. So that's a classic traditional broadcast camera with what's called a live view. And essentially, the technology somehow seems to take several 3G and 4G signals and, and put them into one, so you can now broadcast really high high end. Video from the field live. This is bang. So that person is broadcasting live to a TV station with just a, a little device. Can you see it? It's amazing. There's a, there are three companies doing this Live View, the Giro is another one, I've forgotten the third one. And it's, it shows what you can do with high end broadcasting as well. And yeah, so these are other issues which, which really need to be. Considered, which we don't have time for. The whole ethics thing, because when you deal with speed, you have the potential of, of ethical issues and of doing wrong things, and how do you deal with that? And also the whole issue of deception. I mean, when I, if I'm filming using that reading, what looks like a reading book, am I, am I being deceptive? Am I allowed? Where can I do this? Can I do this inside? If, uh, am I trespassing if I'm shooting inside a your home or a mall. So that's a, the whole sort of legal, ethical stuff is, is really a separate course in a way. Um, voice is really important. I think you need a separate session on presentation of voice. When you, even though you're recording only short bursts of sound when you're doing a voiceover, you need to learn some techniques of, of emphasis and, and things like that. Um, which, and also, you know, Scripting as well. Uh, lighting is another factor. Uh, where to position your your light, whether you use this sort of light or natural light or light coming from the window. <coughs> um, editing and special effects. There are now apps you can buy that allow you to do special effects on on your iMovie product. 
and the latest kit. Uh, there are a couple of blogs out there that. Um, no, I didn't. I'm sorry. Um, there's a guy called Glenn Marcady who works for the Irish Broadcaster, RTG, and he maintains a blog where he tests all of the latest kit, the latest microphones, the latest whatever. And if there's a separate session on what's the best kit to adopt. What's his name again, sorry? Mulcahy, M-U-L-C-A-H-Y, first name Glenn, G-L-E-N. You do a search on his name, yeah. RT, you'll find his blog. It won the award last year for a good blog. Okay. But he, he tests all the technology that's related to Mojo, and he trains Mojos for RTE. For and I said I'd try to finish here. I'll give you time to to go to the bathroom before we go off and just meeting at, uh, uh, is it noon the talk starts? Yeah. 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 So we've got, it's 10 to give you a bit of time. So thank you for your time. I, I always enjoy talking with journalism students because so, you guys are the future. And just remember, this this gives you some potential to do some really exciting stuff. Yeah. So, uh, and I think, as I said, it, it's it's a free software that comes with the latest version of iPad, but it's only free quick to buy. So. And I'm not, I don't have any Apple shares, but they should pay me something for this. <laughs> 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 um, the other thing I should mention too is, um, have you looked at iBooks Author, the software for making digital books? Mm -hmm. It's really mm -hmm. cool. And the nice thing is you can make your videos and then drop the videos into your, into your iBooks. It gives you a really interesting portfolio, mm -hmm. for example, when, you, when you're looking at applying for a job, you could, you could make up an iBook portfolio of all your radio stories, print stories, video stories, and present it as, a, as a, an iBook to a potential employer that might impress them. Again, <laughs> look at the video speaker. So how, how can we present it to an employee? Because when you send a CV, it's like a, a main attachment. So uh, um, you could put it on. You can put it onto your. Um, I'll show you an example. I'll show you Evo's iBook. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So how to merge them? So you could present them with the iPad. Ah, okay. And here's the book. Mm -hmm. Now, I was thinking about like, filing yeah. and we can send the, 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 the Oh, right. Oh, you can also save it as a PDF and email. Oh, yeah. And from the PDF, what comes to No, it doesn't, unfortunately. So you need to lend them. So this is, yeah. I'm lending you my iPad so you can see my presentation. But it's got lots and lots of, it's got 20 something videos built in um, in how to, how to edit. Uh, he recommends various apps like Filmic Pro. Uh, sorry, there's no sound, sound, but that's Evo. So that's the guy you'll see when you go to his YouTube site. And it's got all these. He's recommending a really cool app for filming called Filmic Pro, which allows you to set white mm -hmm. colors and stuff like that. Can I just ask this app, the books that it produces, what what format would they be like used or distributed on? Oh, you mean the iBook? Yeah. Or oh, it's in a special format that Apple use, I can't remember the extension. Okay. So it wouldn't be suitable for like Kindle or anything like that? No, then? no, it only goes into the 53 iBook stores. Oh, uh, right, okay. Yeah. But it's, a, it's the same model as an app. You, um, I've, I've made a couple of iBooks. Um, Apple takes 30%, you get 70 or whatever you charge. So you can keep the prices low, a couple of quid, and still make money provided you get people to buy it. And um, how important do you think it is like, for journalism students to learn this? I mean, for me personally, I've never really thought about doing video, and it's not something that I would specifically want to focus <coughs> on, but still, still yeah, skills. Yeah, um, I guess it depends on where you want to work. But I think realistically, more and more multimedia seems to be the way that organisations are going. And so if you've got these skills, I think you're going to be more employable, even if you end up only writing print stories at least if you like. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think more and more we're moving towards a multimedia world. So it's quite likely that that's what you'll end up. You'll end up doing lots of different forms of journalism. So the other point is, but then everyone being able 
you know, happy to do this. Anyone's got a phone. If you're able to yeah. just do something that yeah. little bit better. Yeah, so it depends on it's now it becomes an issue of quality. And I think you'd agree that these are these had more quality than than something that somebody shoots in the street with their um, with their Nokia phone. I think it's the editing that makes a difference with this and that's that's why I like these is that because it allows you to have a lot of control in the editing process. Which is where this is for the magic stuff. What's the uh, situation with power and microphone? With, um, with the iPhone, the iPhone. Uh, so, I, for example, Chris, and I, I know you mentioned last night that there's, um, there's an iPhone here as well, so you can listen to it. I think it's quite important yes. when you're calling on the deal and what the microphone here is. So, so, what's the power situation with that? I think it draws power off to you from. Well, actually, this doesn't seem to need power, it just works. Under the, Never thought of that, interesting for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as I said, I've done, I've, I've, I've charged this overnight and it's run, it's kept me going for, for an entire day. I've made two videos in a day and still have power with the end of the night. So that's a big recommendation for the, the battery on this. If you were to use two mics, you'd have to have a mixer thing. Sorry? If you were to use two mics, Oh, do you need, um, um, I don't know what they're called. That's being greeted. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Yeah. I'm sure you can probably get some kind of I don't know what it's called. Yeah, yeah that's, that's yes, it. Yes, it's where 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 yeah, these are mostly used for teaching and the fact that you know, some people have iPhone 4s. And, and so when I teach this stuff, I typically go and make a video and then we come back and we plug it in and we critique what they've done in the field. And some people have got an iPhone 4 and 3GS and so forth. So we have to, have to have all these adapters to be able to show people's work. But it's kind of cool to actually go out and make a movie, come back and, and you give me your iPhone, I plug it in, and we see, the class sees what you've just done. It's very powerful. It's also, if you're teaching TV, this is just brilliant for demonstrating um, shots. You want to see what a, a close-up looks like? <laughs> so I, <don't, laughs> I can't. <laughs> you can actually see what a close-up looks like. Here. Whoops, crunch, crunch, yeah. So that, that is... Much better than my telling you what it or drawing it on a whiteboard. This is, you see it and you, you know it, yeah? Extreme close up? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you have to, have to always explain to the closest person you're going to be the person who's going to be used on that <laughs> as a demonstration model. So I, I did want to finish in your time to. So I was going to say, if anyone needs to go to the vet, Um, the rest, I think, will we'll wind down a bit and, and let Stephen, you know, maybe you can see Bernie Wine here, who we were talking about last mm. night. Yes. Uh, those trainings. Yeah. Thank you. I wish you luck in your careers. Good. <laughs>